David secure. Amen. Let's just open in a word of prayer at the end of this morning. Father, we thank you and we praise you for your mighty presence in this place. Lord, your peace that passes all understanding. Father, we thank you for your word. For your word does not return void unto you. Your word is truth. Your word is everlasting. Your word will stand forever. And we thank you. Now, Lord, give us wisdom. Give us understanding as we share, Lord, your word this morning, that God, it will enter into your people's hearts, that it will change their thinking and their minds and, and how they live and how they operate, Father, and how they apply the things that you have for them in their life. We give you the glory, the honor, and the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to be speaking out of First and Second Samuel this morning, but uh, before we get into uh, the word, I just want to say how that God has a plan for your life. God has already orchestrated your life. He has already planned your life. He's already given you um, everything that you need that pertains to godliness and holiness. He's already provided it, and it's all in Christ Jesus. Can you say amen? So his plan for you is a plan of holiness. His plan for you is a plan to um, be accountable and responsible for your actions and your thinking and your motives and everything that you do. So the title of my message today is Two Examples of Accountability. Two Examples of Accountability. We're going to be talking this morning about Saul and David. Uh, both men were called of God. Both men were anointed by God. Both had the special favor of God, but they handled the accountability in different, ma different ways and different fashions. And we're going to talk about that this morning. So if you have your Bibles, open up to 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 1. If you don't have a Bible, the scripture will be up on the, um, the video screen. What is accountability? What is accountability? What does accountability mean to you? Put my slide up. There you go. Accountability is liability, it's duty, it's obligation, it's reliable, it's commitment, it's responsibility, and it's ownership. And whatever decisions we make in life, whatever we do in life, we're responsible and we're accountable for God to those things. And there's two ways of handling, handling accountability, and we're going to get into that this morning. But each and every one of us, even though we may think that we will escape accountability, we won't. We're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, or the white throne judgment, whichever one comes into play. And we're going to stand there and give an account. And God's word says that we're not only going to give account for our actions, but we're going to give account for our words. The Bible says by every word you'll be, you'll be judged. Every single word. That word which is in secret that word that's in your mind, that you think, whatever it is. And now let me say this and qualify that. Every word that's unrepentive. Any word or anything or any action that you have done that, that you have not repented of, you'll give an account for. But once you confess that and you ask God for forgiveness, how many know forgiveness means turning away? How many know forgiveness means repentance? How many know that when, you, when somebody comes to you and says, forgive me, that you, don't, you expect that person not to do that again. Well, God is the same way. When we ask God for forgiveness, we ask God and we repent of our sin, God is expecting us to be accountable and to not do that thing again. Amen? Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 15. We're going to get into this a little bit this morning. I hope I can finish it all. It says, Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to appoint thee to be king over his people. Now, first and foremost, God sent the prophet Samuel. And it's amazing as we do a parallel of David, David was also anointed king. Saul was anointed a king and David was anointed king. But there's a great big difference between the heart of David and the heart of Saul. And here, the Bible says that Samuel came to, the, uh, to, uh, Samuel came to Saul and he said to him, 
God has sent me to anoint thee king over his people, over Israel now. Therefore, hearken unto the voice of who? The voice of councils, the voice of committee, committee members, the voice of deacons, the voice of elders? No. He says, you listen to me. How does God speak to the Old Testament kings and leaders of his time? He sent a prophet. He sent a prophet. How does God speak to you and I today? Well, sometimes he may send a prophet because there are prophets in the Bible in Ephesians chapter 4. But it's not the same prophet. It's a little bit different. The prophet that was sent to Paul when he was going to show him that he would go bound to Jerusalem was Agabus. He was a prophet. New Testament time. Don't forget that. Some people think, well, that's only Old Testament. No. God can speak through a prophet. And sometimes we have to discern and know that when the prophet speaks in the New Testament, it must be backed up by the Word of God. Amen. Come on. They didn't have the Word of God. Not everybody carried a Bible. Not everyone carried the Old Testament scrolls all with them. So in the Old Testament time, the Old Testament prophets, when they spoke, they were actually speaking the very words of God. They became the lips of God, and they said, Thus saith the Lord. But in the New Testament time, it's thus saith the Holy Spirit. It's two different dispensations. Two different covenants. He said, hearken unto the voice of the words of the Lord. So what, does, what comes when God calls somebody? What comes with that? Responsibility and accountability. When you don't know something, you don't know something, you're not accountable. If you're driving down a road or you're driving down a highway and there are no signs posted of how fast you can go, and say you're going 65, 70, 75, 80, whatever you're doing, and a state policeman pulls you over, and there are no speeding signs. He cannot give you a ticket because you're not accountable because there's no written statement of what the speed limit is. God cannot hold you accountable for what you don't know, but he does hold you accountable for the things you do know. Now, I'm talking to Christians now. I'm not talking about unbelievers. I'm talking about Christians. So here God calls Samuel the prophet, and he says, I want you to go to Saul, and I want you to anoint him king. And with that responsibility comes accountability. When Jesus Christ, remember this, you didn't come to Jesus. Jesus came to you. Hello. He says it in the word. You have not chosen me, but I've chosen you. Come on, somebody. You chose him after he came to you. you didn't, when you were living your life apart from Christ, you didn't know about salvation until somebody gave you the word. Somebody came and preached the gospel to you, whether it be on television, radio, or a friend, or someone interacted with you, or a church, or a pastor, or whatever it was, and you finally came to that decision where you were a sinner, and you needed salvation, and you came to Jesus Christ. But don't think for one moment it was you that came. It was God who called you. Jesus said, no man comes to the Father except the Father first draws him first. Amen. Amen. Come on, somebody. That's how it goes. And so here in verse, uh, verse 3, he says, Now go and smite Amalek, and the utterly destroy all that they have. Spare them not, but slay both men and women, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. All of them. What was the voice of the Lord? What was the instruction of the Lord? To go in among these people, Amalek, and to do what? Why would God do that? Isn't God a God of love? Yes, he is. Do we need to fathom and understand all of the acts of God to understand and comprehend who he is? Let me put it this way. How many here have been in the military? Raise your hand. Anyone been in the military? Okay, a couple of people have been in the military. If your sergeant said for you to do something, would you just decide whether you were going to do it or not? I'm getting head shaking. No. 
They gave you an order and you said, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. And you would stand at attention and you would fulfill those orders to the T. Now we have God, who is the commander of the hosts of heaven. And he's telling Saul through the prophet Samuel, I want you to go to Amalek and I want you to destroy everything they have. We don't, we have limited knowledge. We don't, we can't understand that. Well, why would God do that? Why would God, he's killing babies and little sucklings. Why would he do that? Do we understand why? No. But God said it. Just like when God told Abraham, take thy son, thy only son Isaac, and offer him up on an altar. Now, we know the end of the story, and that's nice that we did, but he didn't at the time. We can go back and read it and say, oh, yeah, but he saved him, yeah. He didn't know that. Sometimes God will do things because he knows the future of that people and that generation. Okay? And that's what was happening. He told him to do that. In verse 8, it says this. I'm going to kind of skip down a little bit. And he took Agag, the king of the Amal Amalekites, Alive. Wait a minute. What did God tell him? Destroy everything. See, there's two examples of accountability we're talking about this morning. The first one is being accountable to what you think. Being accountable to what you discern or what you think is right versus what God says and what God says is right. This was Saul's mistake. Saul was a head man. He had a lot of head knowledge. David was a hot man. In fact, the Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. But Saul was a head man. Can I tell you we have a lot of head people today? We have a lot of people that have gone through cemeteries, I mean seminaries. Nothing wrong with a seminary. I've been through seminaries. Nothing wrong with that. I've gone through the studies of that, but I've never allowed the education to overrule the voice of God. I've never allowed the education to overrule the voice of God, of the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit wants to do something one way, I can't say, well, that's not how I learned it in seminary. I have to step aside and say, Holy Spirit, this is your church. Jesus, this is your church. You, you want to you wanna praise for another 10 minutes? Who am I to say no and shut it down after three songs? The Bible says they that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the children of God. There's a pre-qualifier there. They that are led by the Spirit. So many are led by the flesh. and They call it Christian. And they put a designation of a tag on it as Christian. But it's far from Christianity. It has to do, and it's all wrapped up with their own fears. He says, he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive. And they utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. Verse 9. But Saul and the people spared Agag, and look at this, and the best of the sheep. Hmm. Partial obedience. Partial obedience. I'm going to keep the good stuff. Yeah. Why waste it? Keep the good stuff. Spare the king. He said he kept the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatlings and of the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. Right then and there, Saul is in trouble. See, it wasn't just a commander-in-chief going to battle and just saying, you know, we're going to go and wipe them out. No. This was God. God told him to do this. Destroy them all. Don't take anything. Destroy it. First mistake, compromise. 
What do we see in the world today? What do we see in the church today? Compromise. I'm, I'm here to tell you, I will not compromise my Christianity or my inheritance for a bowl of pottage. Won't do it. Not for sale. I won't sell myself so I can have something else. I won't sell my heritage as a Pentecostal believer in the Scriptures and a follower of Jesus Christ for the pottage of this world, for the pottage of fake religion. I'm going to inherit everything that God has intended for me, and I'm not going to deem what God has intended for me as not for today. I don't apologize for nobody. Samuel compromised his calling. He compromised his authority, and he compromised his position as a king. Verse 11. Samuel hears about it, and, it said, and God tells Samuel, he says, it repented me that I have set up Saul to be king. But look at this, verse 11. But he is what? Turned back from following me. He's backslidden. He's backslidden. One thing he did, or I should say one thing he didn't do, was obey God fully. When you don't obey God fully, you're on the road to backsliding. When you don't obey his word, you're on the way to backsliding. But yet, watch, you're going to see something here. He says, he has turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments, and it grieved Samuel. You know, prophets are not happy when God has to give, gives them a word to give to somebody that's not pleasant. And let me also say this. I'm sorry to say this, but I've got to say this for those that are listening by Facebook. You don't have to pay a prophet to prophesy over you. You don't have to give a prophet money. And they'll use scripture, and they'll use Elijah with the woman and the bread. No, I, know, I know all the scriptures. Jesus said, freely you have been given. Freely give. Come on, somebody. And here, he says, look, and it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. You know, sometimes, as pastors, sometimes what we have to do is we have to say things, or we have to bring correction or instruction, because that's what the Bible says. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for what? For reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Sometimes you're not going to like what I have to say, especially sometimes on a private level. But don't look just to me. Look beyond the word. Look to the words of what I'm telling you. I once was talking to a, a, a man, a brother in the Lord. And God showed me something about his life, and I, I had to confront him with it. And I did. He, to my face, took it kind of nice, you know. He kind of smiled. And, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But then the following week, all that week, he was angry. He was mad. The following week he came up and he said, you know, I can't get no peace with God until I confess it to you. I said, what's that, brother? You know, I, Remember, now all I saw was, so I'm thinking he's cool. He came up to me and said, he said, I got to ask you to forgive me. He said, I wanted to punch you right in the face. I said, it was a good thing you didn't. Because I would have turned the first cheek and I would have turned the second one. But after that, Katie, by the door. Come on, somebody. Samuel cried all night. And verse 13 says, And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. Watch out for flattery. Watch out for flattery. People will flatter you when God gives you a word that you don't like, watch out. That person will come flattering you. He says, and look what he says. Look what, look, look what, look what Saul. Saul says this. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Who's he trying to fool? 
Who's he trying to fool? You can't fool God's servant. You can't. And sometimes God's servant won't even allow you to know that he knows. Mm -hmm. There's something that I've known about someone who used to come to this church. I've known it now for four years, and God has not allowed me to reveal it to that person. And you know, sometimes you're near flesh, you just want to tell them. Say, see, I was right. God said, no, don't tell him. But if he comes and asks you, that's a different story. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. What is the one thing that you see here is wrong with Saul? In that statement, I have obeyed the commandment of the Lord. Deception. He thinks he's right. He thinks he's Okay. He thinks everything is hunky-dory. He thinks it's all good. He's deceived. And Saul said, they have, look at this, and Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites. One of the things that will happen when you don't have discernment when you think that you're doing everything right and someone comes and confronts that with, with you, is you're going to blame shift it to somebody else. Oh, they, they have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared, look, for the people spared the best of the sheep. Look at verse 9. It says, but Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep. What he did was he threw the entire responsibility and accountability on the people. What does that show you? That he was proud, that he was not humble enough to admit his mistake. He, wasn't pr he was too proud to humble himself and admit his mistake. So you see these emotions and these things in Saul that were always there and never dealt with. I'm going to tell you as Christians, don't let things fester in you. Don't let these things, unforgiveness, bitterness, anger, hatred, whatever it may be, don't let those things fester inside of you. If you have art against somebody, go get it right with that person, if possible. Sometimes it's impossible. Sometimes they don't want anything to do with you. Well, then God understands that. But so that you can be free in your heart, so that you can be free in the presence of the Lord, just let it go. Confess it and say, God, that's it. I can't control people, how they feel, their emotions, their thinking, or whatever they do. I mean, please, I have people that hate me, and they don't even know me. I have people talk about me, they don't even know me. But that's okay, because I know me. And that's all that matters, if you know you. It doesn't matter. But he blamed the people. Verse 15 says this, And Saul said, They have bought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep of the oxen. Look at this. Now he's trying to bring, now he's trying to bring a spiritual principle in his disobedience. Well, they did all this, verse 15, they, they saved all the good to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. First of all, it wasn't Saul's business to be sacrificing anything. He was the king. He was not in charge of bringing the sacrifices. Samuel was. They begin to take on authority that they have no business stepping into. That's why I love people when they, they when I have they, they they have their own theology, you know. And they come and try to change my theology. Or my the teachings of the word. And I say, Don't give me emotions, don't give me feelings, don't give me what you think. Let's examine the scriptures contextually together and let's see what the scripture says. But don't tell me your opinion. I'm not interested in your opinion. 
Because your opinion doesn't, my opinion doesn't mean it. As a matter of fact, it doesn't mean anything either. It's not about opinion. It's about what does the word say. Here, the word says that the sacrifices were to be done by the, by the priest and by the prophet. Saul had no business. But see, when you have to make up excuses for where you're not with God, when you're not right with God and you're deceived, you have to make up excuses. Oh, these people, they took it so that they could offer a sacrifice to the Lord. Isn't that wonderful? Don't you agree? Isn't that wonderful? He says, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. In verse 16, then Samuel said unto Saul, stay and I'll tell you what the Lord has said to me this night. Now be careful. When somebody says they have a word from God, and I'm going to talk about these, these flakes. I'm not talking about these nuts that are running around. Everybody's got a word. Everybody's got a word. No, oh, I got a word for you, sister. I got a word for you, brother. You know, Really? Where'd you get it? Where'd you get the word? I never forget the time, and if I can, I probably told you this before, but just to mention it so that those listening on Facebook and those who haven't heard this before, uh, when we were at the other church in the little church on Rockdale Avenue before we moved here, had a man come in and visit our church, and he sat in the back. And after the service, he came forward. He said, Pastor, he says, I'm so-and-so. I'm brother so-and-so. He says, um, do you have a word for me? Now, see, I'm just the type of person that if God gives me a word, I'll tell you. But if God doesn't give me a word, I'm not going to make one up. I said, no, I don't. He said, okay. Turned around, left. Didn't come back for another three or four weeks, five weeks, whatever it was. Came back, sat in the back. This time he didn't come forward. He left. He did this for about maybe six to eight months. I'd see him one week, three weeks, wouldn't see him, see him another week. Wouldn't. So finally, after it was all over, he came back and he said to me, he said, Pastor, he says, I'm disappointed in your service. I said, really? He said, yes. He says, all the times I've been here, You've never had a word for me. He says, I've been to other churches, and that's why you haven't seen me. He says, I've been to other churches, and the five churches that I've gone to and visited, every time I walked through the door, they gave me a word from the Lord. He said, but you never gave me a word. He said, I'm disappointed. I said, okay. Can you hold on a second? He said, yeah. So I turned around. I walked away. I said, Holy Spirit, give me a word for him. And the Lord gave me a word for him. So I went back and I said, you want to know something? I said, God does have a word for you. He said, what's that? I said, on those five churches that you went and got a word from? He said, yeah. He was all excited, you know. I said, are you doing what the Lord, the Lord said to you, for you to do in those five words that you got? He said, no. I said, well, here's the word of the Lord. Don't expect another word from God until you start acting on the word that he's given you already. Everybody wants a word, but they don't want to be accountable and responsible for the word that they get. You cannot get another word from God until you're obedient in the things that he's already said for you to do. Come on, somebody. And Samuel said, when thou was like little, look at this, and Samuel says, when thou was little in thy own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? That was little. That doesn't mean he was a tiny person. It means in his own eyes, when he was humble. But all of a sudden, he started getting proud, arrogant. Verse 19 says this. He said, Wherefore, did I, wherefore then this Thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but the, but this fly upon the spoil and did cast evil in the sight of the Lord. And Saul said to Samuel, verse 20, Yea, yeah, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. Wow. Now, you gotta, you got to understand now, here is a man that was called by God, anointed by God, anointed not only to be king, but anointed to hear the word of the Lord. 
And now he's saying, yeah, but I obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone the way which the Lord has sent me and have brought Agag the king of Amalek and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. It was partial obedience. Can I tell you something? When God asks you to be obedient about something, he doesn't want you to do it half-hearted. He doesn't want you to do it halfway. Either be obedient or disobedient. <gasps> Pastor said be disobedient. No, I didn't. I'm telling you what Jesus said, and he said it to the Laodicean church, be hot or cold. You have the choice. Be hot or cold. For if you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. When accountability and responsibility come, you must take that accountability and responsibility and, and treat that accountability the right way, not, not, not the, not the, bad, not the uh, evil way. Look what he says here. Verse 21. But the people, but the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief. Now he's blaming somebody else for his own mistake, for his own stand, for his own walk with God. He's blaming someone else. But the people took the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. In verse 24, and Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord in thy words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now he's honest. Is he honest? Did he really fear the people? He was, a, he was head and shoulders above the rest. He was a warrior. Did he really feel the people or did he use that as an excuse? Again, not taking responsibility and blaming fear and emotion as the reason for his disobedience. Let me tell you, there's countries that I've gone to, that I've traveled to, and I've been threatened. I've been, I've been put in a position where I could have lost my life. Was I fearful? Yes. Did I not go? No, I went anyway. Because when you're faced with a situation and God says go there and do this and you go there and you start to have some opposition, don't cave in that. That doesn't change it. I can't say, well, I'm not going in there. Didn't God say go in there? Didn't God tell Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego not to bow to Nebuchadnezzar's image? How many Christians today would have compromised and they would have, they would have logically and rationally said this, well, you know what? I'll bow down in my body, but in my heart I won't bow down. How many of us would have done that? Not to be thrown into a furnace. Hmm. They said, no, O king, we're not going to bow. Whether you throw us in the furnace or not, our God is able to deliver us. And you know the story, right? They were thrown into the fire, and what happened? They looked in there, and he said, didn't we throw three of those guys in there? How come there's a fourth one in there? Can I tell you, if you take the responsibility and accountability for your Christianity and where you are with God, God will stand with you, and he's got your back. Now, verse 25, now, therefore, he says, I pray thee, pardon my sin and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. Let me tell you something. Sometimes, sometimes, you will lose your calling. You will lose your gifting that God has for you. When you, when you surrender that to something else. Amen. That was the example of Saul. Let's look at 2 Samuel chap, uh, chapter 12 as the example of uh, full accountability with King David. 2 Samuel chapter 12. Ver starting with verse 1. And the Lord sent Nathan. Here's a prophet, Nathan. He didn't come on his own. I don't know why that air conditioner's not coming on. Let me see. 
I didn't even touch it yet. See that? Okay. Praise the Lord. God sent Nathan unto David. Another prophet? Another king? Another accountability? Another responsibility? The Lord said to Nathan, to David, and he came unto him and he said unto him, there were two men in one city. Before I go on, let me say this. What Saul did was something openly. It wasn't something intuitive, intuitively that he did. It was something openly. It wasn't subjective. It was objective. He would not kill the kings and, and the king, and they would not kill the children and, the, and the, all the sheep and oxen and all that thing. He, he would not do the outward. But what we're about to talk about now is the responsibility and accountability of David. But what David is doing now in this situation is secretive. Nobody knows about it. So my point to you is, is that you're still accountable whether you're, you know it or you, you, know, you follow what I'm saying, where you do something objectively or subjectively. Either or, you're going to know. Either or, you're going to know that God is going to be there. How many know that God knows when you do something secret? He knows. You can't pull the, you can't pull the wool over God's eyes. You can't pull all the shades down in your house and think that God doesn't see you. you just because nobody sees you, just because you do things in secret and you don't think anybody sees you, don't think for one minute God doesn't see you. He knows what you do behind closed doors and what your image that you... There's a difference between image and integrity and character. Your image is what people see. Your character and your integrity is what God sees. And your integrity and character is done in secret. Praise the Lord. So here David is going to be talking to Nathan the prophet. Oh, boy. And he came to him and he said to him, there were two men in one city. He begins with a story. Isn't that wonderful? You like stories? Sometimes God will give us a story. And he said to David, there were two men in the city, the one rich and the other poor. Verse 2, please. Thank you. The, the rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds. But the poor man had nothing, you understand, and save one little you, one little lamb, which he had bought and nourished it up, and it, get, and it grew up together with him and with his children and did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and laid in his bosom. He was to him like a daughter. Isn't that how we treat our animals too? You know, you have a dog, right? They're like part of the family, right? Right? So now what he's doing is this prophet is using a story to uh, help David to identify with this man. To allow his emotion to be involved in this man's situation. Watch what's happening. And it came as a traveler unto the rich man. There came a rich man. And he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that was come unto him but took the poor man's lamb, uh-oh, and dressed it for the man that was to come into him. Next verse. So in other words, what he's saying is, instead of this rich man coming and taking something from his flock or taking one of the other animals, he took that precious little ewe lamb, the one that meant so much to the family. What's your dog's name? Maggie, it's like taking Maggie and, and killing it. You know, the, he's a favorite. You know, he's the one that sits with, she, is she? She, right? Sits with you and you pet her and you, she licks on you and loves on you, you know, and takes that and kills it. Now David is enraged. David is enraged. He's angry. And he said to Nathan the prophet, as the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing. Now remember now, David's the king. What he says goes. You know, the Bible says that life and death is in the power of the tongue. 
And that's not what these cuckoos out there are making it sound like. You know, just say whatever you want to. No, 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 no. He's talking about, because it's in Proverbs, and the king was King Solomon. And he was saying, life and death is in the power of a tongue. If the king said, kill her, <laughs> no questions asked. So life and death was in the power of the tongue. David says, whoever did this dastardly deed shall die. What are you talking about, pastor? Let me back up a little bit. You know the story of David when it was a time of war, when he, time of battle that the uh, kings went out to battle? He was supposed to be out to battle, but he was home goofing off. Okay, and he was, uh, he was there, and he went out on his he went out on the porch there and he kind of looked out and there was Bathsheba taking a bath in her home, in her backyard. And the Bible says he looked upon her and she was desirable to have. And so he called for her to come and he was the king. He called her to his chambers. He had relationship with her. She was married, by the way, and she got pregnant. She sent a message to David that she was pregnant. Now, here's where David messed up, too. He said, i got to get out of this. This, this is going to ruin everything. So he began to plot, and he said, you know what? Let's call for Uzziah to come home, right? And when he comes home off the battle, he'll go into his house, and he'll have relations with his wife, and she'll get pregnant, and everything will be okay. So he calls Uzziah. Uzziah comes to him and says, yes, my Lord. And he says, uh, you know, you've been out in the battle for a long time. I'm kind of paraphrasing a little bit, but that's kind of what the story is like. He says, you know, you've been here for a long time. Why don't you go home and spend time with your wife? He says, no, Lord, how can I do that with my men out on the battlefield? And he slept at the door of David. He was a man of integrity. He was a man of character. He would not do that. Now David was all upset now. He said, now my, my plan is not working. So he says, ah, I know what I'll do. He calls this guy over and says, listen, when Uzziah goes back into battle, put him on the front line. David conspired premeditated murder. I mean, that's some serious stuff. Same calling, same anointing. But look at David, what he's doing. Wow. So they put Uzziah back in the battle. Guess what? Uzziah died. So now, come back to the story. Nathan's telling them all of this thing about the little sheep and all this stuff. David's anger was kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, this man that has done this shall surely die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he has done this thing and because he had no pity. Verse 7, thank God for a man of God. And Nathan said to David, thou art the man. Here comes accountability and responsibility now. David could have ran. He could have made up excuses. He could have blamed someone else. He could have blamed his feelings and his emotions. He could have blamed the woman being out on the porch naked, taking a bath, you know, going into her bath. All the time. He could have blamed everything on something else. Nathan said, thou art the man. Let me just look for one minute. I want to see where that scripture is. Hold on one second. Now, therefore, the sword, now look at this is the punishment that he got, verse 10. He says, now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house, David, because thou despised me. Look at that. Thou hast despised me and hast taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Make sure your choices are what God's choices are for your life.
Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee out of thy own house. We saw that in the history of David. Read about the history of David in his life, what he went through after this. And I will take thy wives before thy eyes, give them to thy neighbor, and he shall lie with thy wives in the sight of the sun. For verse 12, look at this. For thou did it secretly. Nobody knew but David. So don't think for one minute that God doesn't know, because he does. But I will do this before all Israel and before the sun. Look at this. And David said to Nathan, now David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. David took responsibility and accountability for what he had done. He didn't make up excuses. He didn't line up all kinds of things before God. He said, no, I've sinned against the Lord. I have sinned against the Lord. I am responsible. I am accountable for my actions, what I have done. So here we have two examples. One example of Saul, God gives him instruction, tells him what to do. He disobeys. It's disobedience. Did David know not to take Bathsheba's wife as his wife? Of course he did. He knew the commandments. Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's wife. He knew that. David is the one that wrote, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against you. But yet when he did sin, he took on the accountability and the responsibility for what he did wrong. In both examples, number one, the Lord sent a prophet. Both examples, they were to be obedient to the voice of the Lord. Both knew that they would do what they were doing. One did his deeds openly, one did it secretly. God knows both. It cost Saul everything, and he tried everything to avoid the inevitable. But in the end, he lost his life. It cost David his family peace and heartache throughout his entire life. If you read the story of Absalom, his son, his own son rose up to try to assassinate his own father so he could have the power of the kingship. You have now seen the two different responses from these two examples. Let me ask you this morning, which way will you choose? Which of these two ways will you choose to be accountable and responsible? God wants to bring you to a place of obeying his voice also. His voice today is the Bible. It's the word of God. I want to close this morning by reading a scripture in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 11. But I'm going to read it from the complete Jewish Bible. I like how it says it here. <clears throat> but you can put it up on uh, King James up there. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5 to 11. Also, you have forgotten the counsel which speaks with you as sons. My son, don't despise, or daughter, don't despise the discipline of Adonai, or the Lord, or become despondent when he corrects you. For Adonai disciple, disciplines, I'm sorry, for Adonai, or the Lord, disciplines those he loves, and he whips everyone he accepts as a son. You ever get a spanking from God? Some of us are so spoiled. We need a good spanking from the Lord sometime. You know that? God does that. He corrects us. He instructs us. In verse 7, he says this, Regard your endurance as discipline. God is dealing with you as sons. For what son, go, what son goes undisciplined by his father? 
if you're a father, you're going to give discipline to your children. Not time out. That's psychological garbage. Send your kid to his room, give him time out. He's got PlayStation, Xbox. <laughs> he don't care. He'll go to his room. But you discipline him like the, the Word of God said. Now, understand, I'm not talking about how some people, they beat their kids. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about discipline. I'm talking about taking action. You say, well, Pastor, give me an example. Here's an example. You have a lamp that your great-great-grandmother left your grandmother and your grandmother left, left, up, left it to you. It's a priceless heirloom that she handed down from generation to generation in your family. And she's got the, you got this lamp on a table right by the entrance of the door. And you have children and they're running around in the house and you tell them, children, don't run around in the house. Not the place for you to be running. You want to run, go outside. Go out in the backyard, run out, run your heads off if you want to. Run everywhere you want to go. But don't run in the house. All of a sudden, the, the front door, wings open, two kids are wrestling, and boom, they go right into the table, knock your grandmother's lamp over. Here's how not to discipline your children. You come running after the crash, and you look, and there's your grandmother's lamp. You take that kid over your knee, and you say, I told you, look what you did to my grandmother's lamp. What? And you start disciplining them because of what they've done to the lamp. The kid thinks that you love the lamp more than you do them. No, you don't discipline them because they broke the lamp. That's the result of their disobedience. But you spank them because they were disobedient to you and what you told them not to do, not to run. So that they put accountability and responsibility on what you've taught them versus a stupid lamp. And they will value that, as the Bible says, correction. God corrects those whom he loves. Listen to this. Regard your endurances as discipline. God is dealing with you as sons. For what son, God, what son goes undisciplined by his father? All legitimate sons undergo discipline. If you don't, you're a mamza and not a son. What's a mamza? In Jewish culture, it's someone who is either born out of adultery by a married Jewish woman and a Jewish man who is not her husband or born out of incest or as defined in the Bible, an unmarried person. King James says, then are you bastards? And we, <gasps> pastor swore, no, 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 it's not a swear. We use it as a swear in our, in our culture but it means illegitimate. Furthermore, we had physical fathers who disciplined us. I remember one time, Joe's father said to me, because I did something wrong. He looked at me and said, you want trouble? <laughs> I, I said, no, 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 no. Remember that? You know that look, huh, he had, Joe? You want trouble? I was like, no, 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 Mr. Fabio, no, no, no. <laughs> And when my father, he would look at me over to the rim of his glasses, and I knew, don't push it. That's it. You've reached the limit. Back. Remember, Joe? My, my dad could holler, and he could scream. How much more should we submit to our spiritual father and live? For they discipline us only for a short time, and only as best they could. But he disciplines, God, us in a way that provides genuine benefit to us and enables us to share in his what? Holiness. The Bible says without holiness, no man will see the Lord. So if you want holiness in your life, if you want the appropriation of God's holiness in your life, you've got to be chastened. Because I, I don't think there's anybody here perfect, including me. Is anyone perfect? Raise your hand. You're perfect. Here, you got a lion devil in you. Let me cast that thing out of you. No, we're not perfect. But we move on toward perfection. Amen? The two examples of accountability. One took responsibility. The other one shifted responsibility. 
one took the accountability of, of what he had done wrong and knew how to get right with God, made it right with God. And let me tell you this. You read in the scriptures, David never did that again. He never did that again. So taking the accountability and responsibility in your life means that when God speaks to you, when God brings a word to you, like he's brought this word to you this morning, then guess what? You're accountable. You're responsible now. To know that God is not up there with this big bat ready to smack you like he gets, he gets a thrill out of, you know, discipline. No. The Bible says to obey is better than sacrifice. When you get a reward for your obedience, isn't it wonderful? But you know what? Sometimes I'm in the market and I see these little kids screaming their heads off. You ever see that? And they're crying, wah, wah, I want that toy, mommy. I want that toy, mommy. Wah. And the mother's like, shut up. Shut up. And he's still going on and on and on, shut up. And she goes over and grabs the toy, throws it in the corner. All right, shut up. I got you the toy, all right? And, it goes, and the kid goes home. You can't do that with God. Hallelujah. You can't do that with God. You can't yell and whine and cry and scream to God and think that he's going to give you what you want just to shut you up. He's not going to do that. God, this may shock some of you, but God does not have spoiled brats. God has disciplined disciples. That's what the word disciple means. Disciplined ones. They're disciplined. Well, pastor, I don't really have time to read the word. Really? Really? Number one, you're lying because you're blaming time when it's your irresponsibility of your management of time. God gave you 24 hours in a day, and when you say to God, I don't have time, you're saying, God, you made a mistake. You should have made 36-hour days. That's, that's inadvertently what you're saying. I don't have enough time, God. Oh, you made a mistake. You should have made 36 hours instead of 24. I can't do what I have to do in 24 hours. No, it's, it's the responsibility, the management of your time. Well, what am I supposed to do? Get up 20 minutes earlier. Read the Word of God in the morning. Early in the morning will I rise up and seek the Oh, take that scripture out of there. Put God first. If you put God first, He gives you time for everything else. He really does. Put God first. He'll give you time to do anything else you need to do. It's amazing. So two examples of accountability. One takes the accountability of his actions. The other one makes excuses of all kinds. So what's it going to be for you today? Will you be fashioned after David? Or will you keep making excuses with God about your disobedience, your unwillingness to change, you want to stay right where you are, you don't want to do anything for God. You don't want to get involved in the things of God. God has great plans for you. He says, I know the plans that I have towards you, plans of peace, not of evil, to give you an expected end. God has plans for you. This is a body ministry. It's not just about a pastor getting up here and speaking. We're a body of Christ, and we all have gifts and talents, and God wants to use those gifts and talents. And I keep telling you, seek God for the gifts. Seek God for what he has for you. The Bible says desire spiritual gifts. Desire those gifts to be used in those gifts. God has given you talents to bring into the church so that he may be glorified, he may be edified. Every single one of you. You say, well, Pastor, I don't really feel that way. I don't, I don't know what my gift is. Well, ask him, he'll tell you. There's not one single person in the sound of my voice, whether here or on Facebook, that God has not a plan for you that God hasn't got gifts for you, 
talents for you if you will just use them and seek him. What are those gifts? And it may just be, and sometimes, you know, like uh, sometimes somebody will say, well, I, I really don't sense anything except I love to help people. That's a gift of helps. It's in the Bible. Sometimes just bringing somebody a cup of coffee. So just sometimes just talking to somebody. So just, just to encourage somebody. Give somebody a phone call and tell them, I'm praying for you. I would love to have that, but as a pastor, I don't get that. And I'll tell you why I don't get that, because everybody thinks I'm okay. Think about it, right? Everybody thinks the pastor's okay. Yeah, the pastor's good. You know, he's okay. No, but there's sometimes I go through some downtime. Amen. Sometimes I go through discouraging times. I was going through a discouraging time the other day. And someone came by the house and stopped in for two minutes and gave me a Father's Day card. They couldn't give it to me last Sunday, so they gave it to me. I said, I have to rush out, but I, I want to give you this. And I, and I just said, thank you. I needed that today. And then I opened it up, and I got a $25 gift card from Buffalo Wings. Yay. Love buffalo wings. Me and Pastor Manny, we love buffalo wings. But call your pastor. When God puts it on your heart, call me. And really and truly, I say this for all you to know. Right? Not many pastors will give you their personal cell phone number. You have the office number, you make an appointment. Or mostly everybody in my church has my cell number. You can call me anytime, as long as it's important. Don't call me 3 o'clock in the morning so you can find a scripture in the Bible. I've had people do that from Maine, and I told them, when I get up there, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> but something important, you can call me 24-7. My office hours are not 9 to 5. Unfortunately, a lot of professional pastors, they are. Not me. I'm not a professional pastor. And so I want to just encourage you today. Be a David. Don't be a Saul. Take accountability. Take responsibility for what God, when he speaks to you, to do something, especially from the word, while you're confronted with something, or God knows you're doing something wrong, and that conviction, you know, how many get that conviction in their hearts? I know I do. If I go to say something, I get convicted a lot when I drive. Because I'm ready to say, oh, you stupid. And I go, oh, Lord, forgive me, I'm sorry. Especially when they're giving fingers and doing all kinds of things to you and, you know, yelling and screaming at you. And they're wrong. They're the ones that went through the stop sign and you beep the horn and you're like, and they're looking at you. Ah, ah, ah. That's where you really know you're sanctified. Let's all stand this morning. Thank you for listening to this broken down preacher. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you, Lord, that you're, you're getting us ready, Lord, for the day of the trump of God to sound. You're getting us ready, Lord, for the second coming of your son, Jesus. You said judgment will begin in the house of God. And Father, you're shaking your church. I pray, shake it, God. Shake it so that we will be accountable to you. And let me just say this too. Every single person in here, you need somebody else. You're not, you don't just go on, you're not just on your own. You need everybody in this church. Everybody needs you. So Father, I pray God that all of us together, functioning as the body, will complete your will, your purpose. And Lord, let love emanate from this place. Let love permeate from this place. Lord, let your people be encouraged and lifted up today with the word that, God, that you want us to be right with you so that you can have a relationship with us, you can speak to us, you can mold us, you can shape us after your will. And, God, we thank you for it. We thank you for the time that we spent with you today. Now, as your people go, I pray a blessing upon them, Lord. Bless their going in, their coming out, their lying down, their rising up. Father, keep them safe from all harm and danger. And we pray, Lord, that you give them traveling mercies.
and a good day to enjoy this day, for you have made it, and we will be glad in it. In Jesus' name. Greet one another as you go. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said amen. Amen. God bless you.